So today we'll be talking about chapter 21, section 3, and that is education and popular culture. Now, the mass media, movies, and spectator sports played important roles in creating the popular culture of the 1920s, and that is a culture that many artists and writers criticize. So before we start talking about pop culture and what Americans are reading, we need to learn about how they learned how to start reading. By 1890, the literacy rate had finally reached the highest point of any nation in the history of mankind. Pretty exciting stuff, but how did we get there? There was no such thing as a state-sponsored public school until the 1830s. There were a handful in the state of Pennsylvania. And then post-Civil War, more of these start sprouting up. But those were simply elementary schools. Uh, before the 1920s, nationwide, only one million Americans had ever attended high school. High schools were called preparatory schools. They were merely to prepare students for the rigors of college, focusing on the academic subjects exclusively. Um, now, throughout the 1920s, the number of Americans attending high school began to grow. And in fact, throughout the 1920s, that number climbed to 4 million. So we can speculate at several reasons why this might be the case. First off, there were no public high schools in the 1920s. We're not yet at that point of universal education through high school for all Americans. In fact, with um, the rising numbers of Americans attending high school, we can draw the conclusion that this means a higher number of prosperous Americans who could afford high school for their children. Uh, it can also lead to speculations about the standards for jobs. With greater technology, there's a greater demand on skilled labor. Now, before the 1920s, high school was strictly for college-bound students, preparatory schools, mostly private. Now, throughout the 1920s, high schools began offering vocational training, training for the workforce. Now, post-World War II, we're going to see a lot more of this. Schools focusing on shop classes, um, electrician classes, uh, home ec classes, nursing, occupational uh, types of courses. Now, before the 1920s, American high schools were strictly offered to students who spoke English, and so immigrant students had to provide their own educational opportunities. However, kind of throughout the 1920s, the, the trend began to move towards more immigrants attending high schools and bilingual services being offered. Um, before the 1920s, the few public schools that existed, again, largely elementary schools, had very little public support very little financial support. Uh, taxes remained low, government services in regards to education remained minuscule. Uh, meaning that when a public school child finished the eighth grade, that was the end of their educational opportunities. There might be educational opportunities for young people who had the means to go on to high school or college. But as the services provided increased, so did the taxes to pay for them. And this has caused much of the backlash in the rise of the services that public education provides. Uh, because who pays the lion's share of taxes? The wealthy. Ergo, who has the lion's share of influence in the political process? The wealthy. And so who would resent to the greatest degree the increase in taxes? Again, the wealthy. But one exciting effect of this is how the literacy rate has begun to affect our culture. Well, for one, uh, mass culture 
we can begin to, to use that term realistically, that Americans are experiencing events simultaneously. Part of this is through newspaper publications with more Americans being able to read, more Americans uh, are choosing to read, and this is creating demand for national newspapers uh, as well as local newspapers, national publications. Uh, two of the earliest national publications were the Reader's Digest or Time Magazine. And radio. Radio was the most powerful communications medium in the 1920s. In fact, it has still remained relevant today. National radio networks have been able to provide a shared national experience ever since. For example, it has remained relevant today. I listened to the radio on the way to work. I'm sure many of you did. I listen to NPR. It's a national syndication. So what they are publishing, what I was listening to on that station, people around the country were listening to as well, allowing for this kind of simultaneous news outlet. But of course, we're talking about what did Americans do for fun. Radio, the most powerful communications medium, because Americans could have them in their homes. Even though, as you heard, $200 for a radio is prohibitive for most Americans at this time, but this was the hot piece of technology that everyone wanted. Uh, throughout the 1920s, generally, people had more money and more leisure time and the freedom to enjoy it. And so what are they going to do? Well, again, we're generalizing here for many Americans, but attendance for sporting events shot up. Uh, glorification of athletes, very common. A few of the famous athletes at the time were, of course, Babe Ruth, uh, the famous <laughs> home run hitter who held the record for most home runs throughout his career for quite some time. Um, he was also a famous pitcher. Uh, just, you know, people studied these individuals lives. Uh, the boxers Jack Dempsey and Gene Tooney. Uh, boxing was one of the earliest American sports, though quickly overtaken by sports such as baseball coming around post-Civil War, basketball into the 1800s, Ted Naismith, look up his story, and then finally football, which evolved throughout the 20th century. But the most famous individual was not a baseball player or a football hero. He was a pilot, Charles Lindbergh, famous for making the first nonstop solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean. He had to do this, it took him 30 hours. He had to do this without modern navigation, barely more than a compass. And he had to navigate by night using glow-in-the-dark algae, or so he claimed. Along the North Sea, there was a type of bioluminescent algae that he used to keep from crashing into the ocean when he couldn't see it anymore. When he landed in Paris, he was an instant celebrity, known around the world. So much attention was drawn to him and his beautiful wife. They had a young child uh, that some negative attention was drawn their way, in fact. Their young child was kidnapped. It was the first case by the FBI. They never found the Lindbergh baby. It's a sad story, but it was the FBI's really first big international case. Here's a little bit of his story. The American movies. You already watched the silent film Steamboat Willie. It was the cartoon at the beginning. The first movie with sound is called The Jazz Singer. and We'll watch a scene from it in just a moment. And um, I can't imagine how just groundbreaking this must have been for its time. You know, we've all seen some movies that moved the industry forward. You know, Avatar, known for its visual effects. Star Wars, known for breaking its box, box office records. Um, but the first movie with sound, you know, this is just... It, it's a paradigm shift, a whole new way of thinking about going to the movies. Instead of reading the subtitles at the bottom of the screen, you can hear the sound in sync with the individual. Now, what we're about to watch is a scene from the jazz singer where he's playing a song called Tutu Tootsie Goodbye. And unfortunately, due to the YouTube downloading issues, 
it's not going to sync up with his lips. So you just need to use your imagination and remember that it would have on the screen. And so this would have been the first time that moviegoers could watch a movie and hear the characters speak. So you've seen some examples of silent movies. You've seen some examples of movies with sound. And one neat thing about the movies at this time was that most Americans were going at least once a week. You see, over the weekend, I watched a movie at home. Uh, I'd never seen Watchmen, so I watched it at home. And the comfort of my own couch, flat screen TV, popcorn at the ready, everything I needed at home. Well, Americans in the 1920s didn't have those kind of comforts. If they wanted to see a show, they had to go to the theater to see the show. If they could afford a radio, they could have that at home. But there were no televisions. Now, tomorrow we'll be talking all about American music and jazz music, one of the first true American styles of music. George Gershwin will talk about a lot tomorrow, famous for using jazz to create this American style of music. Uh, jazz means improvisation. It's fascinating. We'll listen to a lot of it tomorrow. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe was famous for her paintings uh, around New York. Um, you can go online and look at a lot of her paintings uh, very provocative, challenging cultural norms uh, for its time. Next, on to writers of the 1920s. Uh, a little bit of required reading. I'm not going to require you to read it, but you should anyway. Sinclair Lewis wrote Babbitt. It was a satire on conformity and materialism. It's about a young man trying to make it in the business world who has to be just like everyone else, has to have the same car the nicest clothes, the wife and two kids and two car garage and picket fence and all the trappings of middle class. Next is F. Scott Fitzgerald. You probably know him from Gatsby. The DiCaprio movie came out just a few years ago. Miss Pierce will be having you read Gatsby in junior English. Uh, he also wrote quite a few other things including um, This Side of Paradise, um, tender is the night. Uh, most of his writing was influenced from his experiences in the First World War. In fact, he was part of a group called the Lost Generation, a collection of writers who uh, perhaps suffered post-traumatic stress syndrome and much of their writing uh, was influenced by that time. Expatriate Ernest Hemingway was among this group who had also fought in the war and uh, perhaps due to pre depression, perhaps substance abuse, perhaps his experiences in the war, uh, he decided to commit suicide later in life, uh, though he left us with some incredible works of literature, uh, such as uh, Farewell to Arms, uh, Angel with Enormous Wings, um, and many others.